it's, it's a parade, it's a festive occasion of some kind. This woman is trying to read another person's thoughts. But is mind-to-mind -mind communication really possible? Press the button. Scientists have been investigating for generations. Hey, wonderful. One man's convinced he already has proof. He claims that this renowned explorer transmitted thoughts to him from 3,000 miles away in the Arctic. But will the search for the truth about telepathy ever be over? Mysteries from the files of Arthur C. Clarke, scientist, writer, and visionary. The scientist who invented the communication satellite, the writer of 2010. And now in retreat in Sri Lanka, the visionary who ponders the riddles of this and other worlds. About the time I started my writing career, some 50 years ago, I came across this book by an American scientist, Dr. J.B. Rhine, Extra Sensory Perception. I think this was the first time that phrase, now usually abbreviated to ESP, ever appeared in print. In his work, Dr. Rhine claimed to have established scientifically the existence of telepathy, that is, direct mind-to-mind -mind communication. I was so impressed by Dr. Ryan's work that I later used it as a basis for one of my best-known novels, Childhood's End, which has now gone through 50 editions. The idea that we can receive messages from other minds, often from loved ones at a moment of crisis, is very old indeed. Probably most people have had such a sensation at some time or other. But it's very difficult to prove such cases from their nature they are seldom well documented. Much of the evidence for telepathy occurs in the form of anecdotes, some of which are very odd indeed. Cedarburg, Wisconsin is the home of Mrs. Joycey Hearth. One evening in 1955, her husband and son had gone to the movies. Mrs. Hearth's five-year-old daughter, little Joycey, came back late from a birthday party and rushed off to join them. The movie theater was in the main street. Her mother was at home with the washing up. She waved goodbye to me and skipped up the street. And it wasn't very long until all of a sudden I felt a terrible chill that went all through me. I dropped the plate I was washing and raised my eyes to heaven and I said, oh God, don't let her get killed. At that moment, I knew something awful had happened to my daughter. I immediately went to the telephone. I could hardly dial because I was shaking so. I picked up the receiver. I did get the Rivoli Theater and a young girl answered the phone. I said, this is Mrs. Hearth. My daughter was on the way to the theater. She's had an accident. Is she badly hurt? The girl stammered. Mrs. Hearth, it, the accident just happened. Little Joycey had been hit by a car outside the Rivoli. Manager Ray Nichols remembers how quickly the call came. There was no way that anybody could have got down and talked to Mrs. Hearth about her daughter because the phone rang shortly, it couldn't have been a few seconds after that uh, her daughter was hurt, and she says, was my daughter hurt? So I didn't know how she could found out. But it must be about, what, a block and a half, two blocks to her home from here. If they'd had a motorcycle waiting for this to happen, they couldn't have got down there in the time for her to call by the time her daughter got hurt. If you take the shortcut, you go up this street, and just before the corner, there's a parking lot and you can go through the parking lot and between two buildings and come out immediately in front of the theater. There's no way I could see it from this angle. 
it's all at the upper part of the street. I couldn't possibly see it and on a different street. After the accident, little Joyce's first thought was for her mother. And she said, Mama, I sat on the curb and I kept saying, Mama, Mama, I want my mama, but not out loud, just to myself, she said. I didn't hear any sounds whatsoever. I had a feeling, a feeling of terror that ran all through me. I knew she had had an accident. Now, whether I knew it at the time she was hit or whether I had picked up her thought of calling me just a few minutes, few seconds later, I don't know. It had to be sensory, extra sensory perception because there was no other way she could have known. No way. One night in 1952, midwife Gladys Wright was convinced that a patient needed her. The telephone line to her Norfolk home had been brought down in a snowstorm. The patient, Mrs. Goodwin, was not yet due to give birth, but something told Mrs. Wright to go to her. We had her tea about five o'clock, and I suddenly got this urge that she was wanting me. She was in labor, or wanted me, you see. And uh, then it would go from my mind and come back again. And eventually, we decided to go to bed about 10.30. Uh, and could I get to sleep? No fear. I tossed and turned, and this kept going through my mind. The longer it went on, the worse it was. It was a complete turmoil, really. And uh, I thought, oh, well, I decided I'd dress myself and go and see what was going on. And with that, my husband said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to Wigmer to see Mrs. Goodwin. Well, he said, you are a blithering idiot. He said, I should think they'll come for you if they want you. And I said, well, the telephones are out. Why? He said, well, they'll come for you. He said, daft. And I still dressed myself and loaded up the car in this filthy night of weather, and off I go. I was delighted when I pulled up outside the gate to see the whole house lit up. So I literally ran down the garden path, and believe me, there she was. My patient was with her hands on the kitchen table. Obviously, you could tell, in strong labor. And I did want her badly, because there was nobody else I could get. And the nurse, uh, I mean, the doctor, he was not in the village either, so uh, we couldn't get him. But fortunately, she, she appeared out of the blue, <laughs> out of the snow, I suppose, really. Stephen Goodwin was safely delivered in the early hours. His mother's often told him the strange story. What do you make of it? What can I say? I can't, really, can I? I was compelled to go, without a doubt, in mind. And she wanted me, didn't she? Shirley Evans and Pat Craven are old friends. In 1977, Mrs. Craven was on holiday in Mombasa, Kenya. Mrs. Evans at home in Lincolnshire. One morning, I heard Patty. I was asleep. It was dark. And she woke me up. She called me. As near as I can say it, she was saying, she was in very great distress, and she was saying, Oh, Shirley. Oh, Shirley. And I woke up. She woke me with that. And I could see her. I could see her head, shoulders, um, just below the bust line. Now, I must explain that Patty is a very smart lady, but she was dressed in the most appalling rag. It had a square neck like that. The sleeves were all in one. It was a, it isn't the kind of thing anybody, any woman would wear sort of willingly. This bit here was either lace or torn. It wasn't the kind of thing that Pat would ever wear. But in Kenya, Pat had injured her ankle. And in hospital, she'd had to wear a rough cotton gown. When I came back and called Shirley, the first thing she said was, whatever happened to you? I said, how do you know? She said, well, I, I saw you in a peculiar gown. I said, yes, I've been in hospital. And uh, she said, I made a sketch of it. So I said, well, have you? You see, so she, 
will you make a sketch of it and see if we can compare notes? And so I did. And when I went down to Shirley's, oh, three or four days later, they, it was more, more or less identical. I don't know how she saw me, but I, I thought of her when I woke up. Obviously, she just pick, picked me up. Most cases of telepathy appear spontaneous, flashes of lightning out of the blue. But some people have deliberately attempted to establish telepathic connections, often over great distances. Perhaps the most optimistic experimenters of all attempted to transmit thoughts across the length and breadth of North America, from the icy wastes of the Arctic all the way to an apartment in New York City. The man in New York was journalist Harold Sherman. Today, he lives in Arkansas with his wife, Martha. The results of his extraordinary experiment in telepathy are carefully preserved in their country cabin. In 1937, Sherman met a famous Arctic explorer, Sir Hubert Wilkins. Wilkins was preparing a new expedition. He'd been hired by the Russian government to search for a plane thought to have crashed near the North Pole. Uh, everything possible is being done to find our missing aviators. Wilkins flew north in a consolidated flying boat. Both Wilkins and Sherman were believers in telepathy. They agreed to try a long-distance test. Three nights a week at 11.30 New York time, Wilkins would go over the events of the day in his mind. 3,000 miles away, Sherman would try to pick up his thoughts. Well, Catherine, uh, we've gone uh, 20 miles here. We just passed that little church. So is this a Meanwhile, this man, Reg Iverson, was trying to keep in touch with Wilkins in the conventional way, by shortwave radio. Forty years on, he's come to reminisce with Sherman at his retirement retreat in the Ozark Mountains. After all this time. Iverson swore an affidavit which stated that his efforts to contact Wilkins had been constantly frustrated by poor reception. In fact, he'd got through only 13 times in five months and attested that Sherman had received more information by telepathy than he had by radio. One night, Sherman even picked up a message meant for him. He got an impression uh, from uh, an impression that uh, Wilkins uh, had an urgent message for me to uh, cancel an order for a piece of radio equipment for one of the members of the crew, of the search flight crew. And uh, the next day, uh, when I went down to the office, why, there was this message here for me. Uh, sure enough, canceling the uh, order for a radio receiver for uh, Holly Kenyon, who was the uh, uh, pilot for the search flight. A leading parapsychologist, Dr. Gardner Murphy, checked Sherman's impressions against the log kept by Wilkins at his base, Aklavik, in Alaska. One day, Wilkins saw a dead dog on the ice. It was one of the many details of the expedition Sherman says he noted on the day that it happened. Another was a fire which broke out in a white house. Get a definite fire impression as though a house burning. You can see it from your location on the ice. I first thought of fire near your tent. But th this may also be true, but the impression persists. It's a White House burning and quite a crowd gathered around, people running and hurrying toward the flames. Whatever Wilkins did in far off Aklavik, Sherman seemed to know. Even the minor discomforts of the expedition did not escape his inner eye. I had a feeling that uh, Wilkins and maybe members of his crew had uh, bumped their heads on some object I couldn't determine what. And I recorded, and these are the actual words. Sudden severe pain comes to me. 
right side of head. And Wilkins wrote me some weeks later, this day, I and members of my crew could not keep from rubbing our heads rather severely on the low overhanging stove plates, which we'd installed in uh, our shelter. Sherman's notebooks contained dozens of these impressions, later confirmed by the expedition log. To Wilkins, the success of the telepathy experiment came as consolation, for the Russian plane lost in the polar wastes was never found. In 1930, in a book called Mental Radio, pioneer telepathy tester Mary Sinclair claimed she could reproduce drawings hidden in sealed envelopes. One target was a bird's nest, this is what she drew. Another a volcano. She was right again. But Mary Sinclair's experiments were unsupervised and so failed to provide scientific proof. Dr. Joseph Banks Rhine was the first to put telepathy testing on a scientific basis. Volunteers in his laboratory at Duke University in North Carolina took part in thousands of card guessing trials. Ryan designed a range of scientific apparatus, including special packs of Xena cards with distinctive symbols on them. By chance alone, one card in each pile should match the target. Ryan claimed some people, by scoring much higher, proved the existence of ESP. On the other side of the Atlantic, British researchers followed his lead. They too set up elaborate precautions. Experimenters were kept apart. A set of random numbers determined the target cards, and next door, the receiver's guesses were carefully logged. But though they tried to be more scientific than their predecessors, these laboratory pioneers failed to convince the world. Today, the search goes on with children. Which of these pictures shall we choose? Which one? Shall we pick that one there? All right, let's, you press the button. That's the sender button. chooses one picture from five and concentrates on it. We're working, good. The receiver has a 20% chance of guessing right. Oh. Shall we try another one? Which one? Shall we pick this time? That one there. All right, press the button. Oh, hey, we got it right. More than 2,000 children of various ages were tested. The three-year-old scored an extraordinary 46%. Now, what you would have expected, according to chance, was 20%. So in other words, they were scoring more than twice the amount that they should have obtained. Uh, and this was absolutely outrageous as far as ESP tests went. In the next group, the five-year-olds, they were scoring at about 35% accuracy. Again, compared to 20% by chance. So again, their scores were still very, very high. And the last group, the six to eight-year-olds, were down to about 26%. Uh, so not quite so good, but still statistically very significant. Now, what this meant was that here was a very interesting relationship. The older the, child, the children were, the lower was their ESP score, or vice versa. If you want to get a very good score, use very young children. Dr. Spinelli believes that telepathy is a gift we are all born with. But as we grow up and develop a sense of identity, we learn that we have to keep some thoughts to ourselves. As we, as we grow older, we build up mental defences against letting our thoughts escape from our, from our brains or whatever. Uh, we sort of build up barriers, uh, mental barriers, but the, chi the child still hasn't learned how to do that. And so he, his thoughts are, in a sense, still very, very open. Uh, because of that, then, you would expect uh, better scores in ESP, and that's what I seem to have found. White noise is still quite uneven. It sounds almost like ocean waves breaking. The latest technique, the Gansfeld. Seeing only red light and hearing only neutral sound, Deborah is cut off from the outside world to make her mind receptive to telepathy. 
Almost images of a, well, a rock garden or a rock waterfall, a, a Japanese quality to it. The experiment works with having Deborah just talking about her ideas, her impressions, and having me writing them down at the same time. And at the same time, there's somebody in a distant room who's concentrating on a picture, which might be an art print or something. And hopefully some of what um, the sender, as he's called, is concentrating on will get across to Deborah and come out through her imagery. Lettuce growing in a vegetable patch. Growing in furrows. Again, similar, reminiscent of my, the garden my grandparents had when I was a child. The, the general tendency you'll find goes towards one particular picture. You might get association to something that's in the picture, like um, if somebody see, sees a bicycle, and perhaps what's in the picture is a pair of spectacles, and they look pretty similar, but they're not exactly the same thing. So you can look for correspondences like that, and in general, it's that kind of stuff that tends to get you the good results rather than occasional specific fantastic matches. Deborah knows it was one of these four pictures. Can she pick the right one? I had actually a great deal of correspondence with this one. I saw a fair number of Disney type yeah. characters, which this is a cartoon image thing. I saw some animals, which with the poor hedgehog there. Uh, my cucumber, Chris being cut in half, could quite easily be uh, one of the cactus shapes. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of green. This one is the only one that has any real green colors in it. I saw tablecloth, which the curtain vaguely reminds me of. So I think I'll put right. that, rank that one as my first choice. Well, it's now 50 years since Dr. Ryan published his book. Yet scientists are still arguing about the very existence of ESP. For myself, I must confess I'm getting rather disenchanted with the whole subject. I feel if it was really anything in telepathy, by this time the arguments would be over. We wouldn't still be waving our arms at one another. Besides, if telepathy exists, why isn't it there when we really need it? What could be more valuable? Think of all the thousands of lives that would be saved every year if we could send mental messages from mind to mind. Yet, though I'm disenchanted, I'm not completely disillusioned. I still think that there might be something in telepathy. So I'm rather glad that serious researchers are still collecting these often puzzling and always fascinating stories. In 1947, Leslie Bowie was in the RAF. He shared a tent at El Ferdan in Egypt with another airman, Jock McLean. His life was a picture of comfort until one night. I woke up with the most terrible pain in this finger. Nowhere else, just in that one finger. It got so bad, uh, gradually the pain went up my arm until I must have been almost crying out with agony. Old Jock wakes up and said, whatever's the matter? He, he, we, I both, we both got out of bed, sat on the side, he went outside, took my mug, got some cold water out of the chatty, poured it in, and said, here, put your finger in this. So I sat there, my finger in the mug on my wooden locker, like that, just to try and ease it. Leslie was in pain for hours. Unknown to him, so was his wife back home in England. At work, a piece of metal swarf had become embedded in her finger. This is the finger. And the pain, well, it was down there where it was cut and where the swarf was. And the pain, of course, was terrific, and it throbbed down my hand and my arm. And then the doctor said, well, come and see me in my surgery in the village, which I did. And I went and he lanced it. And what a relief it was. May wrote to Leslie about her finger, while from Egypt, Leslie was writing to May about his. I made it my business to ask me which finger it was that she'd suffered, and it was the same one. And by working out the time factor of United Kingdom and Egypt, at the very moment that May must have been at the doctor suffering this agony of this 
glancing of this septic finger was exactly the same moment that I was suffering in the tent at Alpha Dan, 4,000 miles away. Stigmata, the wounds of Christ 